Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here. So I'm interested in uh, program verification. And one way to do it is to use the language-based uh, approach. So here on the left side, you have a sequential program with some safety property, like a violation of some uh, assertion. So one way to, to, to check uh, algorithmically this property is uh, to use a language-based uh, uh, approach. So in this approach, what you will do is that uh, uh, you will extract a pushdown automaton for the control of the, uh, uh, of the program. And you will extract here a finite state automaton for, uh, uh, that speaks about the data of the, uh, of the program. So I okay, guess so for the control, we have uh, basically the valid sequences of statements, but you don't interpret them. It's just sequence of statements that the program can, can do, but you, you don't give them interpretation. And the finite state automaton will restrict uh, among those sequence of an interpreted statement, those which are semantically uh, valid. Okay, and by taking the intersection of those two, you obtain the, 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 the program execution. So now if you look uh, at the type of those uh, uh, languages, so on the top for the control, you have a context-free uh, uh, language. At the bottom here, we have a regular, and the intersection of the two is, again, a context-free uh, language. And the safety checking problem on my program reduces to language emptiness on this uh, context-free language. So this approach has uh, limitations. And one serious limitation is that for the uh, regular language, so you can only model finite, finite data domains or finitized uh, data domains. So here in this talk, I will uh, show what you can do when you want to consider infinite uh, data domains. And that's the, 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 the picture of the, uh, of the result. So, on top, uh, unfortunately, we will not consider uh, uh, fully the context-free languages. We're going to consider an under-approximation of context-free languages. And this under-approximation uh, will be parameterized by some uh, integer. And the intuition is that the higher is the value of d, the more uh, execution you cover. And uh, at the bottom, we're going to consider Petronet uh, uh, languages. So the idea here is that one marking in the Petronet represents one data value. And since you have potentially infinitely many uh, markings, so you model uh, infinite data uh, domains. So and I will show that the combination of the two is actually what I call an extended Petronet uh, language. And remember that the safety checking reduced to some uh, uh, emptiness problem. So it will be uh, the case also here. And uh, it's uh, also decidable. OK, so that's for the big picture. Now let's, let's get into the, uh, 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 the details. So first, some notation. So, uh, so here, I'm uh, for the context-free uh, language, I will not use the pushdown automaton. I will use context-free grammar instead. And context-free grammar that uh, uh, generates bounded index context-free language, which I will uh, define in a, in a minute. And for the data, we have a patronet with two markings, an initial and, a, and a, a final one. And that's the question that we are asking. So we are asking if there is some word in the, in the language, so in the bounded index context for language. So th and this word is a, a, a sequence of transition. And these words bring me from the initial marking to the, uh, to the final one. So I will sometimes use this uh, picture here where this uh, depicts a derivation tree in the, in the grammar, and, and, and at the leaves, it gives you the word that's generated, and you want to go from the initial to the uh, final. I will also use uh, uh, this, this symbol. OK. So let's, uh, OK, let me define what are those bounded index uh, under approximation of uh, context-free language. So just a quick reminder, so a grammar, you have a set of variables. You have an initial uh, symbol. You have an alphabet. So here I use T because my alphabet is actually the transition of the Petrinet. And then you have a set of production. OK, you have an example of grammar here. So a derivation, so this is just a, a, a sequence of words over the variable and the, and the terminals. 
such that from one world to the other you apply some production. Okay? Okay, no more interesting stuff. So what's the index of a derivation? So for the index of a derivation, you look at each step in the derivation and you count how many variables you have. So here I have one variable, two variables, one and zero. So it's just the maximum number of variables you have seen along the derivation. So for this derivation, the index is two. Okay? So the definition of the language generated by a grammar, so that's the classical one from textbooks. And this one, so it's the D index under approximation of uh, G is only all those words that you can derive using some derivation uh, of bounded uh, index. So if you want to think about it intuitively, so know when you derive a word, you have a budget on the derivation and you must uh, uh, stay under that, uh, that budget. So for the above grammar, so okay, for any grammar, the uh, index, uh, the approximation of, of index zero, it's always empty. For the above one, uh, the index, uh, the under approximation of index one, it's also empty because the only choice you have at the beginning is to apply that production rule, which produce uh, two, uh, two variables. So, and, okay, the index uh, two approximation, it gives this set of words, and in that case, we are very lucky because it coincides with the, uh, the context-free language. So what, what to get away from this slide is just that the bigger the D, the larger is the under approximation of the, of the uh, context-free language. Okay, this is one interesting result. So, here, when I defined the D-index uh, approximation, I had to change the definition of uh, what's the language generated by a grammar by putting these constraints on, uh, uh, on the index of the derivation. So it turns out that uh, uh, given a, a D, you can actually build a grammar such that uh, it embeds the, the, the budget constraints directly in it. So, and I'm not going to go into the details, but the idea is that you're going to throw uh, indexes on each variable, uh, yeah, you're going to throw indexes for each variable of the grammars, and then you will rewrite your production uh, rules in, in, in that way. And the interesting case is, is this one. So when you have two variables on the right-hand side, so one can keep index i, which was the one of the left-hand side, but the other one has to go one index uh, lower. So you cannot have uh, two sons with the, the same index. So one of the two has to, uh, to decrease. And the language of that grammar, so for, let's say, d equal to 3, is coincide with the uh, uh, three under approximation of, of, of that language. So, okay, now you might think, okay, he's going to be speaking about those uh, bounded index approximation, but why, why should we care about that? So let's see what are the, 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 the pros and cons about those uh, approximations. So if your language is regular, it's generated by a grammar of that form, then the index one approximation coincides with the original language because you only rewrite a, a, a variable into another variable, okay? Also, if the language is linear, so for instance, here, this grammar generates A to the N, B to the N, also the uh, under approximation of index one coincides with the language of the, uh, the grammar. So you may notice that if you use pushdown automaton for such a language, you cannot bound the, the the stack space that you need to recognize that uh, language. Okay, and then there are some uh, uh, more exotic results that say that if the language is a subset of the trigger expression, then there, is, there exists a D uh, such that the under approximation coincides with the original language. Also, if you assume commutativity of concatenation, meaning that in that set, under that assumption, AB equals BA, so you can also, uh, you also have that there exists some value D such that it captures the, the original language. So, and the negative result is that, for instance, visibly, uh, visibly pushed down uh, languages are not of a bounded index. So, if you consider the language of a well parenthesized expression, where A is opening parenthesis and A bar is closing parenthesis, so there is no index that will capture the, the whole language. Okay, so now. You know what are those uh, bounded index approximations. So in input, we have a grammar. So we have a value for the index we want to consider and this patronet. So, and this is the problem we want to solve. So let's go. Well, actually, not yet. So let's do something much simpler. So let's forget about patronet for now. Let's just take finite automaton. Okay? 
So I replaced the petronet by a finite state automaton with uh, initial and final state. And what I want to know is that it's the same question. So if there is a word that I can derive uh, in the grammar and from the initial state, to, uh, it leads me to the final uh, state here. So it's basically the language intersection problem for a regular language and a context-free grammar. OK. So and how, how I can uh, solve this, this, this problem? OK, so I'm starting from this uh, uh, x0 uh, uh, variable. So if it is the case that there is a production uh, uh, that rewrites this variable into sigma, and from the initial state in the automaton by reading sigma, I end up in the final state, so then I'm done. So because the word is just uh, uh, sigma, OK? So that's for the base case, if you like. And for the inductive case, you have the, uh, the following. So, so if your uh, variable rewrites here to b, d minus 1, and, and, and c, d, so now you can ask the problem uh, uh, twice. So because, OK, let me explain. So what you want to go is to go from the initial to the final state. So what you can say is that, OK, I want to go to the initial to some q prime by taking a derivation in b, d minus 1. And then from this very same q prime, I want to go to the final state by using a derivation of, uh, uh, of cd. And because of that production, I know that if I can uh, uh, find uh, those, I have solved my original problem. And number three is just uh, uh, the same thing where actually the, uh, uh, the index are swapped. So the d minus 1 comes first, and here the d minus 1 uh, comes last. OK, now let's uh, gather those intuitions and put them inside some uh, uh, algorithm. And the property of this algorithm is that it's going to return. So it's going to reach the return statement. So what can happen else is that the assert statement here fails, if and only if I have such a word uh, uh, w. OK? So and that's a recursive algorithm. And uh, what, what it takes in, in, uh, in parameter is uh, the variable of the grammar, the initial one, and two states, uh, initial and final, uh, of the finite state automaton. OK, so you have the base case. So e you, you guess basically some production starting from x uh, l that rewrites it in sigma. And if this assert succeeds, then you can just go to the return statement, and you are done because you found the witness, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, sigma. Now you have the uh, two inductive cases uh, here. And this is what I explained you. So you want to go from the initial to the final. So you guess one guy in the middle, and then you solve two problems. So going from qi to q prime and q prime to qf. But here, look what I did. I did some, something uh, uh, which you would not expect. So for instance, so the first recursive call to query is always on the variable with the lowest index. And here, the, the, uh, the variable with the lowest index comes second. It comes after B, uh, B of L. But I choose to call uh, query anyway first for this, uh, uh, this one. OK? And it does not uh, change the correctness of the, uh, of, of the algorithm. Also, if you look at the first recursive call compared to the, uh, the, the caller, you can see that the index is, uh, uh, is decreasing each time you do this uh, recursive call. And also, you can observe that the second recursive call, it's what is called the tail recursive call. So basically, this call, you can get rid of it by using a go to statement. So that's a, a programming language uh, technique. So, Actually, what you really have is only one recursive call, because the second one, they can be replaced by go to. And for those recursive call, the index is always uh, decreasing. So you know that the depth of the stack is going to be uh, bounded by, by L. All right. So now what I'm going to do, so remember, I had three parameters. So the variable of the grammar and uh, 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 the two states of the automaton. Now I will. Since now I know that the stack is bounded, I can take those parameters uh, uh, out. Actually, I'm going to only take uh, the states of the automaton. And I can deal with them on the site in two, with two arrays. So I, I can do that now, because I know that the recursion depth is, uh, is bounded. So 
from this uh, query algorithm you saw in the previous slide, I'm not going to write a new one which I call traverse, and that use those two arrays that basically models uh, uh, two stack of bounded, uh, bounded height. So it's basically the same algorithm, but no, instead of referring to the parameters, so I'm just uh, referring properly to the right uh, 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 complements in those two, those two arrays. So in here, let me explain you how you have to deal with arrays because it's not, uh, not uh, that obvious. So, so here you have a call at level L and you want to know if you can go from QY to QF. So what you're gonna do, remember, you guess a guy in the middle and you have two subqueries. So what you're gonna do is to first, you're gonna copy QF at the stack frame uh, uh, before here in, in, uh, in the array MMF. Then you're gonna guess uh, the Q prime uh, state in those two uh, frames here. And now you're gonna solve, uh, you're gonna call, uh, you, you're gonna have this recursive call for L minus one. So you will actually solve this query now. So can I from C L minus one find a word that brings me from Q prime to QF? And if you return, then you just continue by uh, solving this, this query that remains. So there is this little bit of programming with the uh, stacks, but nothing too, too complicated. Okay, now let's get back to Petronet. So because basically I've put all the ingredients I need to, uh, to deal with Petronet. So now my arrays, uh, they, uh, they don't contain a, a state of a finite state uh, uh, automaton, but they contain markings of uh, Petronet and uh, an initial and a, a, a final marking to, to start with. Okay, and that's now uh, my uh, version of Traverse which deals with, uh, uh, with Petronet. Okay, and so that's all the, uh, uh, okay, those are the statements of the, 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 the previous version uh, for the finite state automaton. So you can see how you match uh, what we had for the finite state automaton in the case of, 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 of the Petronet. Okay, so, okay, okay. So now let's, uh, uh, I will uh, okay, explain you again how, how we do, uh, we deal with the logistics of the two stacks to, uh, uh, to prepare for the recursive call. So we will have to copy uh, the marking to transfer the marking from this frame to this one. So this is when I invoke this transfer from two uh, uh, function. Then we're gonna guess some marking, which just adds non-deterministically token in in, uh, in places of the net. So for instance, I can guess uh, uh, this guy, and then I will do the, the 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 same thing. So okay, one important observation, and it's. Uh, it's that you, when you do this transfer uh, of tokens, you don't need to transfer everything. You can just uh, do a partial transfer of, of, of the tokens. And the whole algorithm stays correct in, in, in that case. Uh, it, it's because of monotonicity of, of, uh, uh, of Petronet. Okay, and why I'm saying that? I'm saying that because now if I look at all my function calls here, all the red uh, uh, statements, so for each of them, I can write uh, some, uh, this is like low level Petronet programming for each of, of those uh, statements. I'm not gonna go into the details, it's just uh, uh, boring, but. So okay, and what you have to remember from that slide is that what you see now in the slide, so everything but the assert statement we have here is just a Petronet. So I have a fancy notation for Petronet, but it's nothing but a, a Petronet here. So I just have now to deal with this assert statement. Okay, and this was the assert statement that was uh, displayed on the, on, the previous word, on the previous slide. So what we know about Petronet and test for zero, so when I say test for zero, it's, uh, uh, it coincides with the assert statement, is that they don't mix well together. So if you're not careful, uh, you cross the decidability line uh, all the time. There is only one case that is known where you preserve decidability. It's uh, when you use uh, uh, assert statement of that form. So you have to fix a total order on the places of the Petronet. And when you test uh, uh, for zero, so you can test S1 for zero by itself. But if you want to test S2, you cannot test it by itself. You also have to test S1 and et cetera. 
So if you want to test Sn, you have to test all the other guys from zero. So in that case, the, uh, the reachability uh, problem for this extension of Petronet, it's known to be uh, decidable. It's a result by uh, uh, Heiner. So now if I look at the assert statement I have uh, uh, in the program, so what, uh, what we have shown in the paper, and you can actually easily observe it, is that if you test uh, uh, for all those places instead of uh, just uh, those, it does not uh, modify the correctness of the algorithm. And then you just have to find an ordering on those places, for instance, this one. And then you fall back on the result of, uh, uh, of Heine. Okay? And this concludes the proof that if you want to decide reachability uh, uh, along uh, uh, bounded index context-free uh, uh, traces, so this is actually equivalent to, uh, uh, I mean, you can reduce it to uh, reachability in uh, this model of, uh, of, uh, of Heine. Okay, and that's the main result of the paper. We have also have shown the reverse direction. So if you take the model of Reinhardt, you can actually set up some bounded index context-free language uh, and so on, such that the, uh, the, the, you can do the reduction the other way around. So, and, but still the general problem for full context-free languages, so this is uh, still uh, open, and I think it's a very hard problem. Thank you.